Life is filled with problems. Job 14.1 reminds us of that when it says, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble. Now, do you have some trouble today? You're not alone. Join me as we look at four age-old problems that Solomon faced so long ago. They are truly modern problems. photographer got a call from his editor. There was a big forest fire and his editor wanted him to get some pictures of the fire and he said to him, said, hey, you need to make your way to the local airport. I'll have a plane, a small plane there waiting for you and he's going to fly you out and uh, you need to get some pictures of this fire. So the guy gets all his stuff. He said, okay. He drives. It takes him about 45 minutes to get to the, to the local airstrip. He gets there and uh, sure enough, there's a little Cessna and it's, it's uh, all fired up and so he jumps in with all his equipment and he tells the pilot, he says, let's go. We got to go. We're running out out of daylight. And so the pilot takes off and he says to him, he says, once they get up in the air, he said, now I need you to pass by the north side of the fire and make about three or four low passes. And the guy said, well, why do you want me to do that? He said, well, because I'm a photographer. I'm, I, I take pictures. That's what I do. I'm a photographer. I take pictures. And he said, so you're not the flight instructor? Needless to say, they both had a problem there. We're in a series on the book of Ecclesiastes called Life Under the Sun. That phrase is used 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the writer of the book, Solomon, the king of Israel, the son of David, is looking at life, and he's looking at life strictly from a humanistic, secular perspective. He's, he has glimpses where he sees God, but God is not the overarching focus at all of what he's looking at. He's basically saying, uh, what is life like under the sun? If I keep God out, if I keep heaven out, what can I find in life that will satisfy me, that will make sense? And he says, the answer is nothing. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's, it's empty, it's meaningless, it's, uh, it's futile. To try and understand life without God is, uh, as one writer put it, it's a riddle wrapped in an enigma. It doesn't make sense. Now, Solomon lived 3,000 years ago. And Solomon is writing, as you're going to see in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, he's writing about the problems of his day. The problems 3,000 years ago, we'd call those ancient problems. But we're going to see today that the problems of Solomon's day 3,000 years ago, those ancient problems are the same as our modern problems today. Sometimes we look back at the ancients and we say, well, what did those guys know about anything? I mean, they, they didn't have a cell phone. They didn't have TV. They, they were, they're, they're Neanderthals. They, they don't know anything. I want to tell you, Solomon knows way more than you and I put together. And uh, the, the thing that makes Ecclesiastes such a powerful book is the fact that the man who wrote it was given wisdom and knowledge and understanding from God like the sand on the seashore. He is way more understanding about life and about subjects in life and about science and chemistry and engineering, those kinds of things, than any of us because God gave him that ability to understand things. And the man with this ability said, I looked from top to bottom at life under the sun, when you leave God out, when you leave, leave heaven out, and I found that it doesn't make any sense. So in chapter 4, he's going to look at problems, problems that face all of us, problems that faced him and his kingdom, problems that face you and me today, ancient problems and modern problems. And 
Hey, when you think about it, life is filled with problems. The book of Job says this, bad times don't come up from the dirt. Trouble does not grow from the ground, but people are born to have trouble as surely as sparks rise from a fire. They're just born for trouble. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world you'll have trouble, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. Now, do you have some trouble today? Do you have some problems today? Maybe you have problems in your family, or maybe you have problems in your finances, or maybe you have problems in your physical health. Maybe you have some trouble, some problems at school. Maybe you have social problems or uh, some kind of other type of problem, a problem with a neighbor, a problem with a friend. Man, life is filled with trouble. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble, Job 14, 1. Well, Solomon is going to focus on four troubles, four problems that his kingdom faced, that he witnessed, and you, we're going to see we face those and we witness those today. And some are kind of universal to our situation, and then some get very, very personal. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Solomon says this, Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun, and behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Modern problems are ancient problems, so let's look at four age-old problems. First of all, there is the age-old problem of oppression and corruption. Solomon is king. But as he looks out, Ecclesiastes 4, 1 through 3, and in one, verse 1 especially, he's probably looking at a court of law. He's probably in some uh, kind of observing what's going on in court, and he said you have the powerful here, and then you have the oppressed over here, and the oppressed isn't getting justice and all he sees is corruption, and the powerful are deciding things in their favor and not in the favor of the oppressed, and the oppressed is weeping. There are tears there, but who cares? It falls on deaf ears. It's much like the story Jesus told in Luke 18 about the widow that came before the judge, the judge who didn't fear God and didn't respect man, and she says, give me legal protection against my adversary, against my opponent, and he didn't want to do it because he didn't care about her. And she had nobody. She was just a, a widow. Uh, uh, women didn't go to court like that. They would send a man. She didn't have a man to send. And so here she is, and she is powerless, and she is coming before this judge who doesn't care about her, doesn't fear God, doesn't respect men or, or man. So here you have uh, a situation that Jesus talked about, existed in his day. Everybody could relate to that. Now, he told that story to talk about prayer, but everybody could relate to the parable. It's like, okay, I can see where that would happen. Well, Solomon says, that's happening in my day, and I'm the king. What gives? Those in power, those with force and strength and wealth and might oppress those that don't have it. Now, that's a subject we hear a lot about today, the oppressed and the oppressor. Uh, that's in critical race theory that is rooted in Marxism. And what was Karl Marx all about? The, the workers need to unite and overthrow those in power and set up this communistic, socialistic, communistic uh, enterprise, and then we'll have utopia, and then everything will be wonderful. Now, as we think about that, it's important to step back and see how this uh, plays out in Scripture. What does God have to say about this whole idea of power and corruption and oppression? First of all, God's way is justice and fairness. That's God's way. Man's way is not that, but that's God's way, and that's how God judges. As Abraham said to the Lord when in Genesis 18, shall not the judge of all the earth, you God, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? 
Shall you not be righteous and fair and just? Of course, God is righteous and just and fair. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 4.1, talking about judges that had power, people that had power that were not impartial. They were very partial. God does not show partiality. He's no respecter of persons, and God's ways are justice and fairness. Now, every one of us, when we go before a court of law and we're being accused of something, we don't want to go before that court knowing that the thing is rigged. It's rigged against us. We want to have a level playing field. And if we're in the right, we say, well, I need justice to prevail. And our founding fathers, when they put together the Constitution of the United States of America and they wrote the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They understood that. We have our pledge with liberty and justice for all. That's how America is founded. That's how it was set up. Now, not every, uh, you can make the case, that, okay, not everybody that was part of the founding of America was a, a, a godly, uh, sold-out, born-again Christian, but all those guys knew the Bible, and even a guy like Ben Franklin, he knew what the Bible had to say. He led the, the con, uh, Constitutional Congress into prayer and, uh, and said, we need to pray. Hey, Psalm 127, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain, they build it. If the house isn't going to be built without the Lord, how are we going to build this government without the Lord? And he, an unbeliever by all accounts, led that convention into prayer. Those guys were steeped in the Scriptures. And we adopted as our country this idea of uh, justice being blind. We have a personification of justice, Lady Justice. Have you ever seen Lady Justice? We have a picture of Lady Justice. She has the scales of justice in her hands. She has the sword of retribution in her right hand. In her left hand are the scales of justice, and her eyes are blindfolded which means justice is to be fair and impartial. That's the way God judges. He judges fairly. He judges impartially. God is just, and God is fair. But now man is not just, and man is not fair. Man's way is corrupt. God's way is justice and righteousness. Man's way is corruption. You have no doubt heard the phrase attributed to Lord Acton, who lived in the late 1800s. He said this, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That phrase is used over and over and over again. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And man, fallen man, when he gets power, what does he do? He tends to use that power in a corrupting way. He uses that power to benefit his friends and his posse, and he uses it against his enemies. We're seeing that happen today in our country. Now, our founding fathers set up branches of government to oversee different branches so no one branch could get so powerful that they could overrun other people. But that's starting to break down in America today. When you lose the fear of God, you lose everything, and we have lost the fear of God in America. And here's the thing. People tend to blame God for these things. So you have in the book of Genesis, God creates. He creates everything, and it's perfect. He creates a perfect man. He says, it is good. And then he creates his counterpart, woman. And he says, it's very good. And he puts the man and the woman in a garden and everything is wonderful. But then Genesis 3, they sin. And what happens after they sin? Well, they open up the floodgates of evil into the world. 
For by one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. And that happens in Genesis 3. In Genesis 4, you have the first murder. The oldest son, Cain, murders his brother, Abel. And then you get into Genesis 5 and Genesis 6. By Genesis 6, God says, I'm going to have to destroy the world with a flood. Every intent of the thoughts of their heart is only evil continually. God is sorry in his heart that he made man. It didn't take long for that to happen. And why was the world in such a mess? Because God made it a mess? No, because man sinned. You and I live in a fallen world. You talk about oppression. You talk about the people with power, and they're oppressing the people that don't have power. Well, how do we fix that? Well, it's the evil that resides in your heart, in my heart, in our heart as fallen human beings. It's never going to be fixed until this world is governed by the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes in power and glory, and then he sets up his kingdom, and then the world is ruled by righteousness. So the way that the founding fathers set it up to have branches of government that would oversee, that was designed, because they knew it was in the heart of man, that was designed to help with the injustice that takes place in the world. So what did we see for a, a, a summer what, a couple of years ago, all these riots, all these fires, because that was perceived injustice. And we heard the, the phrase, uh, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. And so what are we going to do? We're going to, to burn the cities down. And so people that had nothing to do, no dog in the hunt, they had their businesses burned, and some of them were killed. And we have people that say abortion is wrong, so what are we going to do? We're going to blow up abortion clinics. You mark it down. Justice is never enacted unjustly. That's not how you bring about justice, by acting unjustly. You know, it's, it's like the, the Muslims, you know, the radical Muslims. What happens if you speak uh, negatively about the radical Muslims, t saying that you guys, uh, you know, you murder people that don't believe the way you believe. It's, it's jihad, you know, we're going to uh, kill the, the followers of Satan and all that stuff, the great Satan, the United States. And if you speak out about that, they say, you better shut your mouth. You call us murderers again, we're going to murder you. Oh, okay, well, that kind of proves my point, doesn't it? But that, they do that, right? I mean, you say something like that, and you're, you're in, in trouble. Hopefully, they're not watching. And uh, <laughs> so we see that, no justice, no peace. So we're seeing no justice, so we're going to burn the cities down until we get justice. That's never God's way to do anything. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now Solomon looked at that big problem of oppression and he said, I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But hey, better off than both of them is the one who had never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. He's very cynical and very skeptical, skeptical obviously, in verses 2 and 3. Better off dead or to have never existed. Why? Because of the age-old problem of oppression and corruption. Second modern problem age-old problem. There's the age-old problem of jealousy and covetousness. Jealousy and covetousness as it relates to work. Look what he says in verse 4. He said in the ERV, easy to read version, then I thought, why do people work so hard? I saw people try to succeed and be better than other people. They do this because they are jealous. They don't want other people to have more than they have. This is senseless. It's like trying to catch the wind. Now, when we think about work, work is a good thing. God created work. When Adam was first created, the first thing that God did with Adam, before he gave him a wife, he gave him a job. He put him in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. So work is a good thing. I believe that in heaven, we will have jobs. 
and we will love to do what God has given us to do because work is a good thing. And so we're not to work like it says in verse 4. We're not to work for uh, jealousy and for this competition and for rivalry and for this idea that, well, you have more than me, and so I'm going to work harder to get more than you and get ahead, and so I have a bigger house than you have. No. We're to work diligently for the glory of God. That's why we do anything. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 31. We were created for God's glory, to, to brag on God and to magnify God and to make God uh, look good in our lives. And how do we do that? In whatever we do. It, it doesn't mean that you have to go to church 24-7 in order to glorify God. Martin Luther said a dairymaid can milk cows to the glory of God. If whatever you do, you do for God's glory and for God's honor, that can be, provided that it's an honorable work, uh, that can be something wonderful. And so we are to work diligently for the glory of God. And he says in verse 5, talks about those that don't work. He said, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. You say, what does that mean? Well, that, that, he's talking about the guy that doesn't work. Folds his hands in idleness, and in an agrarian society, if you don't work, if you don't prepare the soil and you don't plant, then you're not going to harvest because there is not going to be anything. And so when other people are harvesting, you're consuming your own flesh. You got nothing to eat. You got a big old plate of jack squat because you didn't do anything right? So you need to work. Work is a good thing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.10, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. We have a lot of people today that refuse to work. We're to help people who can't work, not help people who won't work. There's a big difference between can't work and won't work. And for those who won't work, able-bodied people who won't work, we're not to help them because the Scripture says, let them get hungry. Because hunger will motivate them to get to work. Work is a good thing. And we work to the glory of God. But then he goes on to say we need to have balance in work. Have balance between work and play. One handful of rest, he says in verse 6, is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, Yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it's a grievous task. There needs to be balance between work and play. And some people, they just give themselves over to work. You know, Solomon did that for a while, trying to find satisfaction. In chapter 2, he just gave himself over to work and achievement. And what does he say? He said, hey, why am I doing all this stuff? I'm working and working and working, and then I'm going to die one day and leave that to somebody else, to my son. And who knows whether he's going to be a wise man or a fool. And he can squander all the things that I labored so hard to get. You can't take it with you. So he said, this too is vanity, striving after wind. He says in chapter 2, so I hated life as I looked at that situation. Hey, balance. Warren Wiersbe says, blessed are the balanced in life, where you have work and you have leisure, you have play, and there's balance between the two. It's not just all work and very little play. All work and no fun makes Jack a dull boy, or however that little phrase goes, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. If you have all play and no work, that makes Jack a poor boy because he's not working. And so you have to have balance. Debbie was so good when the girls were little because she would, they'd come home from school, and Debbie is, she is misdisciplined. You look up discipline in the dictionary, there's a picture. She is so disciplined. I love that about her. I'm not like that. And so she is great at that. She was the one in school when you got the, the assignment that said, in four weeks, there's a research paper due, and she starts that day going to the library. Well, I got to get, get on this because in four weeks, there's a research paper due. All I hear is, you don't have to do anything for three and a half weeks. <laughs> That's what I hear. She doesn't hear that. 
So after three weeks, she's done with the paper. My paper is due the night before I'm scrambling. I got to come up with some footnotes. I got to, you know, that's, that's the difference. So she taught our girls, we work and then we play. We get things done, we do our homework as soon as we come home from school, and then we can play and do what we want to do. But you don't play and then work, and I think that's a, a great plan. Balance between the work, but get the work done. And listen, when it comes to jealousy and comparison, because that's what he said was fueling the work, don't compare, but find your satisfaction in the Lord. We have a terrible problem with comparison. And listen, that really hits people when you get to be in your 30s. You know, uh, Adrian Rogers preached a sermon one time about 1 Corinthians 10, 13, about temptation. And he said, you know, temptation comes in stages in life. When you're young, you're tempted with the lust of the flesh. Flee youthful lust. You're tempted in the area of sexual immorality. When you get into middle age, you know, uh, probably starts about uh, 30, 35. You know, we talk about middle age. Somebody's 55. Well, he's middle aged. Oh, yeah? How many 110 people, 110 year old people do you know? Uh, you're, you're way past middle age if you're 55. If you're 35, you're about middle age or 40 because, uh, you know, 70 to 80 years, that's what the scripture says you got. Some of you are living on borrowed time, but that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, but in, I noticed this when Debbie and I were, were in our 30s. You started noticing other people's houses. Oh, they have a nice house. I wonder, what that, I wonder what kind of money that guy makes. Debbie, why don't you ask him if you can see his W-2? You know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you just start noticing that. Boy, they just, it's such a big place. Look at that car they drive. It's, you just notice those. Well, we want to have that. We want to have a house like that. We want to have a car like that. They have a, a weekend uh, lake house. Why don't we have that? Well, maybe it's because you can't afford that. So what do we do? We extend and extend and extend, and, and we think those things are going to make us happy. They don't make us happy. So don't compare yourself with somebody else. You never know. My boss, when I worked at Nalco, he said, don't ever start looking at what someone else has, especially in their house, and start singing, well, maybe I ought to be doing whatever that guy's doing for a career. He said, you have no idea where that guy gets his money. He could have had somebody that was very wealthy that died and left him a million dollars. But he's not telling you that. He doesn't wear a sign that says, hey, I'm the recipient of a million dollars. And it's just, so you don't know. So don't compare. Here's what the Scripture says. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? He has said, so that we may confidently say, Hey, what do I have as a Christian? I may not have anything in the bank, but I have the Lord Jesus Christ living inside through his spirit, and that is worth more than anything. So he has said that he will never leave me nor forsake me. He has said that he'll provide for all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Because he has said that, I can confidently say that my helper is the maker of heaven and earth. And the God who made heaven and earth, he's a heavy hitter when it comes to help. So Solomon says, hey, you, you look out at the modern problem of jealousy and covetousness. He didn't come up with an answer, but the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Modern problem, age-old problem number three. There's the age-old problem of loneliness and isolation. Look what he says in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. You say, what is he talking about? What's the problem there? Well, he, he's presenting it as 
a good thing to have a companion. The problem is the problem of not having a companion, the problem of loneliness and isolation. Now, you mark it down. God made us with a need for companionship. He made us with a need for companionship. That's why he, perfect Adam in a perfect garden with a perfect God, he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him. Now, God was going to populate the world through Adam and Eve, so he had to have a, a female counterpart for Adam, and God blessed marriage. But not every single person is designed for marriage. The Apostle Paul is a great example. Some try and say, well, you know, the Apostle Paul was probably married at one time, but he wasn't married in his ministry. I guess his wife died. The Bible never tells us that the Apostle Paul was married, never tells us that his wife died. We do know that in his ministry, he was single. Peter was married. Paul wasn't. And so Paul not married, had relationships and companionship with many wonderful Christian friends. He went on his missionary journeys, first of all, with Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. They took John Mark with them. Remember that first missionary journey? John Mark bails out. And then when they go on a second missionary journey, Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark. Paul's like, no way. That guy, he, he bails on you. And there was a, such a sharp disagreement that Paul and Barnabas didn't go on a second missionary journey. Paul went with Silas. And Paul had Silas. And Paul had Timothy. And Paul had uh, Dr. Luke that went with him. Paul had relationships with lots of people, close relationships, kindred spirit friends, because we all need that. God made us with a need for one another. Interesting little study, Romans chapter 16 Paul does his greetings, and he mentions 29 people by name that he wants them to greet, people that he had relationships with. It is so important to have relationships. We have lots of people today who are so lonely. Uh, Harvard did a study back in February of 2021, and the study said this, 36% of all Americans, including 61% of young adults, feel serious loneliness. Serious loneliness. They say, what is the definition of serious loneliness? Serious loneliness is feeling lonely almost all the time. That's a terrible thing. God didn't create us to live lives alone and isolated. And you know, one of the worst things in marriage is when you're married and you feel so alone. You know, the old country and western song, sleeping single in a double bed. You know, you just, you just uh, feel so separated. And, and here I am, and I should be close with my spouse, but we're not close at all. We're married, but we're, we don't know each other at all. We're like two ships passing in the night, and lots of people just live isolated, lonely lives. And they, they come to church, and, and listen, this is what we always say at the membership class. Listen, you need to get involved in a small group. Church is great and church is important, the big worship time, but that's not where you really get to know people. You get to know people in a small group. You need to be a part of a smaller class with people in your age and your stage of life that you can do life with. You know, during the pandemic, we had lots of people isolated and uh, they were doing online church. We had that for a while. We have that now, and we welcome the people that watch us online, but it's not the same because church is a, an assembling together. Church is coming together to love and encourage one another, to spur one another on in love and good deeds, to rub shoulders together and to be encouraged by one another and to be lifted up by one another. And you don't get that just watching on the couch, it's not the same, and we need to assemble together, and that helps us with loneliness. Now, you've got to ask yourself this question, am I lonely for a season, or am I lonely for a reason? My dear friend, Sean Breedlove, when he got his first job after college, 
He moved away and didn't really know anybody. He was a bank examiner. He would travel around a lot, and he knew the people he worked with, but he wasn't really, uh, you know, like, there weren't people that he was hanging out with. And he said, I was really lonely. He said, but I was lonely for a season because the Lord was trying to teach me how I needed to make Jesus my best friend and how I needed to, to take that time to spend with him. He was lonely for a season. Some people are lonely for a reason. You say, what does that mean? Well, you're doing things that are short-circuiting relationships. You are, you are lonely because you're not friendly to people, or when you get around somebody that is friendly to you, you overwhelm them with your problems, and they just can't handle all that, and they just back up. My friend, Dr. Wayne McDill, my preaching professor, if you have trouble with my preaching, you need to call Wayne McDill. He taught me how to preach. But uh, dear, dear friend, and he told the story in class one time. I wrote about it in my book, and he told the story about this kid that came to see him, came to his office during office hours. Sat down and he said, well, Dr. McDill, everything's terrible. I don't have any friends. Nobody likes me at this seminary. And, you know, Christians are supposed to be nice, but nobody's being nice to me. And I don't have any friends. You didn't want to say that stuff to McDill because McDill was, he spoke the truth in love. Uh, it was the truth in love. And uh, he had the truth down pat, the love part. So I never wanted to ask McDill, hey, what did you think about my sermon? Because he would tell me. And so anyway, this guy, and so McDill says, what do I look like, your mother? Why are you coming in whining about that to me? And the guy's kind of taken aback. He said, you don't have any friends? Well, look at you. Who would want to be your friend? I was like, wow, you know, I mean, it's just tough love. And he says, look at you. You need, your hair's all messed up. Your clothes are dirty and wrinkled. You need a shave. And all you ever do is whine and gripe and complain. Who would want to be your friend? I, he said, you know what that guy did? I said, did he go kill himself? He said, <laughs> he said no. He said, I told him, you need to go to the mall, and you need to buy some, some nice, fresh clothes and a nice shirt and a pair of slacks, and you need to cut your hair, and you need to start shaving, and you need to sow seeds of friendship. If you will start sowing seeds of friendship, you will start to reap a crop of friends. Why? Because you reap what you sow. And he said, that guy went home, and he shaved, and he got his hair cut, and he went to the mall, and he got some clothes that were nice, and he started to sow seeds of friendship. And lo and behold, amazingly, people started to call him up and say, hey, we're going to the movies. Do you want to come with us? And they started to treat him differently. Why? Because he wasn't sitting at home waiting for people to call him. He took a step out there and said, I need to get involved in people's lives. And I need to be somebody that others would want to be friends with. Listen, friendships flourish when we focus on the needs of others. When we sow seeds of friendship. A man of many friends, Proverbs says, must show himself to be friendly. The Bible says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others, as you will start to befriend lonely people. You'll be amazed at how God blesses you with that. My youngest daughter, Sarah, has such a great personality. I used to tell her as a little girl, I said, Sarah, God has gifted you in this way of making people feel loved. And I said, here's what I want you to do at school. I want you to find the kid that looks like he doesn't have any friends, that looks like she doesn't have any friends, and you befriend that person. You let them know that Sarah is your friend. And Sarah has tons of friends because she shows herself to be friendly. So the age-old problem of loneliness and isolation, and lastly, there's the age-old problem of chasing popularity. Chasing popularity. Here's what the Scripture says at the end of this chapter. Easy-to-read version. A young leader who is poor 
but wise is better than a king who is old but foolish. That old king does not listen to warnings. Maybe the young ruler was born a poor man in his kingdom, and maybe he came from prison to rule the country. But I have watched people in this life, and I know this. People will follow that young man. He will become the new king. Many people will follow this young man, but later those same people will not like him. This is also senseless. It's like trying to catch the wind. Say, so what is he talking about? He's talking about the fickleness of the crowd. He's talking about people who, who constantly try and chase popularity. Oh, they want to be liked by people. Now, I want to be liked by people too. I don't know anybody that says, you know, I just want everybody to hate me. But here's the thing that we need to remember, especially in the world in which we live today. If you stand up for Jesus, Jesus said, John 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. You try and make friends with this world and you try and get everybody to like you, let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to make yourself an enemy of God. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. The Bible says in James chapter 4. We have a lot of Christians today, a lot of pastors today is so sad. They are so trying to be like the world and friendly with the world so that they can win the world. That's not how you win the world. You come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And you walk with God and you speak the truth in love. You don't tell people what they want to hear. You tell people what they need to hear. That's what we're called to do. We're watchmen on the wall. We're called to sound the alarm, and when you see the enemy coming, you let people know. This lady got on to me on, uh, on Twitter. I don't know who she is. She's just somebody that she's latched on to me and constantly responding to things, and you're a terrible pastor. Uh, I would never go to your church, and, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, well, thank you, uh, you know. And she's like, why don't you be a, a preacher who loves people? Why don't you embrace people and just tell them they're fine? I said, hey, do you want to go, if you have cancer and go to the doctor, do you want him to tell you the truth or do you want him just to tell you what you want to hear, that you're fine, wonderful, uh, live your life? I said, my job as a preacher is to be faithful to the Lord. It's not to be popular with the crowd. I'm not going to be popular with the crowd. None of us in this room, nobody watching uh, on television, uh, listening on radio, watching on live stream, if you walk with Jesus Christ, you mark it down, you will not be popular with this world. They took our Savior and they nailed him to a tree. What do you think they're going to do with you? You're not going to be popular. So get that out of your mind. Be faithful. Jesus said this, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the false prophets. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I'm not talking about being uh, obnoxious to everybody you meet. Well, I'm going to go out of my way to make you hate me. I'm not talking about doing that. But if you stand for truth, you mark it down. Truth is hate to those who hate the truth. And we have lots of people who hate the truth. And you stand up for the truth, and they will hate you. That's okay. They hated Jesus. And the crowd is fickle. That's what he says in verse 16. The same people that uh, elevated you to king, those same people will then get tired of you. And they'll want somebody else. What did they do to Jesus? He comes in on Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the son of David. Hail him, hail him. And five days later, they're saying, crucify him. Nail him, nail him. That's how the crowd goes. Don't chase popularity. And listen, younger people have trouble with this because of social media. And you put something out there and you want likes and you want comments and you want followers. Oh, I want to have that. I want to build this platform. Be faithful to God and he'll take care of the rest. The Bible says of Enoch that he was not for God took him. He walked with God for 300 years, and it says before his being taken up, he obtained this testimony that he pleased God. That's the Christian life in a nutshell. Do you please God? 
Because if you please God, it doesn't matter whom you displease. And if you displease God, it doesn't matter whom you please. We have lots of politicians that are pandering to the crowd, and one day they're going to have to answer to God for the things that they're doing. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Hey, ask yourself this question. Am I pleasing God? That's the question of all questions. We perform for him, an audience of one. We live our lives to his glory so that at the end of life we can hear him say, well done, my good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Don't chase after popularity. Pursue him. He's worth it all. As we close out the program today, I want to invite you, if you've never done this, to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. You say, Jeff, what's involved in that? Well, it's simply to cry out to God from your heart to say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now I open my heart to you Forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll make that kind of a decision and pray that kind of a prayer, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Let me know about your decision to trust Christ. Let us know about your prayer requests. You are important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.